We're really delighted to have him here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome General Peter Corelli. Now, I've read reports and seen estimates that say that over 80 percent of our veterans uh, are suffering from some form of chronic pain. Um, that can be a number of different things. Uh, one of the things that is giving us all a lot of trouble right now is the heavy loads um, that they're carrying. And one of the things that both Jim and I worked on was to try to lighten those loads. Uh, the problem is every time we would take some weight on, off of them, a platoon sergeant would turn around and say, okay, take a little bit more ammunition with you now that we've saved 10 pounds. Uh, it was kind of a, a fool's errand we seemed to be on at times. Uh, but muscular skeletal is part of that, uh, and, and pain is a real problem in this country. 100 people a day, 100 people a day in our country die of a, a drug overdose. And 50 of those are from opiates. And one of the most commonly prescribed opiates is Percocet. Uh, I saw that as I was studying uh, the suicide issues that the United States Army and, in fact, all the services had. Uh, and I'll talk more about that later on. Uh, the number of, of kids that I would see um, once I was able to look into their circumstances involving their su suicide, the number that were on opiates was huge. If you take Percocet for 90 days straight, there's an 80% chance that you will be on Percocet five years later. Five years later. And um, you have three times the chance of being prescribed Percocet if you're on Medicaid, Medicare or a veteran? Medicaid, Medicare, and a veteran. Now, when you consider all of the above with the fact, and I found this very, very interesting, Alex uh, gave me this statistic um, out of the um, British Journal of Medicine. The average doctor interrupt time in Switzerland is five minutes. That means when you go to see a doctor in Switzerland and the doctor says, tell me what's the matter with you, in Switzerland, you usually get to talk for about five minutes before the doctor interrupts you. In Great Britain, it's 90 seconds. In the United States of America, it's 16 seconds. Now, now you may think that's a very, very odd, uh, odd number, but I'm going to try to weave back to that uh, a, a little bit later and, and, and tell you some of the things that I ran into as vice. Um, I believed when I inherited MedCom, and that's basically what the vice ended up doing, um, that the, as I got into it and talked more and more, that the, the RVU, the relative value unit, that thing that says that you have X number of minutes per patient to take care of them, um, was really at the heart of our business model. And as hard as I tried to get my docs um, to, to think a little bit differently, the fact of the matter is they've been brought up in a system that basically said it was good if they sent less people onto the network, the TRICARE network, and took care of them themselves. Dr. Barbara Rothbaum, who I consider one of the pioneers in the treatment of post-traumatic stress, uh, has told me um, that she has had a very, very difficult time uh, getting the military services to adopt her cognitive therapy treatment for post-traumatic stress that has proved very, very effective. I confirmed that at the VA hospital here in San Francisco today, um, that uh, they use cognitive uh, therapy and, and said it was very, very effective. Um, and they kind of added to this story by telling me, you know, we're all dressed up, ready to go to the dance, and, and, and we get them after you have failed them. I will never forget showing up at Fort Carson, Colorado, and having an 06 psychiatrist come up to me as I was pushing virtual behavioral health as a way that we could triage our soldiers when they came back home because we didn't have enough resources. And he looked at me, and I was in uniform, and the stars were there, man. There were eight of them there on both sides. <laughs> and, and he told me, he said, you know, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and I said, you're not going to do what? He says, I am not going to do virtual behavioral health because I have been taught that you've got to have the, you've got to see him sweat. He's got to be there. You've got to be able to see that for, I said, well, then you, what you're saying is there's going to be a large cohort you're not ever going to see because you don't have enough resources unless we can find some way 
when we have 3,500 folks show up at a post-camper station, you either stop seeing all the patients you've got, if you're going to triage these folks, okay? And you bring them on down and you get your docs and you work them 24-7 and they don't do a very good job, okay? Or you don't do any triage at all. You give them a piece of paper that they all know how to fill out so they don't have to come back and see the doc later on. I will tell you the clinic that the Marine Corps has at Camp Leatherneck, I, I think is probably the finest traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress treatment facility I've seen anywhere in the world, and it's in a combat zone. Um, and it, I, I loved hearing the story about how the <coughs> Command Sergeant Major saw his Marine report for duty with gold pins in his ears from acupuncture, went through the roof, but realized that this acupuncture was helping his young Marine, uh, and even in the Marine Corps, those pins were accepted for four or five days until they worked their way out of the ear. Um, absolutely amazing. And, and, and these concussion recovery centers were supported by commanders because they had a 98% return to duty rate out of Leatherneck. Whereas before, every single soldier we sent out of country, I had never seen a soldier come back into country that was sent out of country for traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress. What I believe needs to happen is, number one, education. We need to educate um, the American public and Congress about the true state of where we are with the diseases of the brain. And, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm a tanker, but as I look back and I talk to individuals, I, I would argue the science of the brain is about 30 years behind where we are with the science of the rest of the body. That's not to say we have not made huge strides in the last years and have the opportunity to make even greater strides. But the fact of the matter is it has not come, we do not have a blood pressure cup to put on somebody to say what it, their degree of post-traumatic stress is. We don't really even know, I believe, what mild, moderate, and severe TBI is. And we need to educate the public about that. And the profession needs to educate the public about it. I fault the profession, and I call that, that's my term, for all of those neurologists and psychiatrists who sometimes make it sound like everything will be OK. This generation is an amazing generation. We've asked less than 1% of our citizens to fight for 11 years. That is amazing. We've never, ever asked so few to do so much for such a long period of time in an environment that if you have not been in it, you can't possibly understand it, because we've done a horrible job of explaining that um, back here in the States. We want to become the American Heart Association for the diseases of the brain. Um, there's a lot of things going against um, us in this, in this area, and one of them is, is that we, we continually think of these as individual diseases rather than the fact that they emanate out of the brain. I decided to talk about pain today because I had somebody come to me and say, you know, you, you ought to really include pain because of this huge pain bill we have and the answer isn't always a pill or an injection or whatever to get at it. Um, and um, we, um, we're, we're working very, very hard um, to come up with novel and new ways of, of putting together funds to go ahead and fund uh, key and critical research um, that our scientific advisory board, led by Steve Hyman, uh, who was at NIH for a while, uh, or NIMH for a while, uh, the provost at, at Harvard for 10 years, and is currently with the Broad Institute, leads our scientific advisory board, uh, along with Magali Haas, to, to find what the most uh, promising science is and see if we can't find a way to scale it up and fund it to a level that gets us um, the answers we need. I am totally frustrated by where we are in understanding post-traumatic stress. And I know the brain is hard. I know how difficult it is. You know, I know all the reasons why we shouldn't expect it to happen, but I am not going to accept that. And uh, I, I, it was not my decision to go after traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress first. 
It was Patrick Kennedy's decision to go after traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress first. It wasn't the general who rolled into town and said, this is what we should do. It was Patrick Kennedy who said that we owe it to these great warriors who have done what they've done for us for the last 10 years. We owe it to them like we owed it to the Vietnam generation to get at this and to fix it. And we're going to do everything we can to fix it. And that, in a nutshell, is what One Mind is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank General Hewitt.